Great. Good morning, everyone. My name's Leanne Hodson, and I work at the University of Oxford, and I'm delighted to be chairing the Harry Keane Rank Nutrition Lecture. I've had the privilege of working with this year's awardee, and it's Dr. Pamela Dyson. Just to tell you a little bit about Pam, she's been involved in nutritional management of diabetes and obesity for over 30 years. She began her career with the Medical Research Council at the Dunn Nutrition Unit in Cambridge, and then she joined the NHS, where she, where she specialised in diabetes management. She's worked for Oxford University for 25 years and successfully completed her PhD in 2010. She is currently employed by the Oxford University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. Her main interests are in the delivery of diabetes, dietary education, gestational diabetes, and behavioural aspects of lifestyle change and weight management. And I can attest to how good she is at it. She made our participants incredibly comply incredibly well, and they all very much enjoyed working with her. She is, a, she is the co-chair of DUK's Nutrition Working Group and was a member of the second NHS England Diabetes UK Committee, which published a report on the role of low carbohydrate diets in type 2 diabetes in May 2021. She is currently working on projects studying the prevention and management of gestational diabetes and is part of the Diamond team, investigating a low carbohydrate, low energy food intervention in primary care, aiming for diabetes remission. I will now look forward to hearing her talk. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed as much as I will. Thank you, Leanne, for your kind words. And can I start by saying how honoured I am to be delivering the Harry Keane Rank Nutrition Lecture this year. And I'm going to be talking about nutritional guidelines for diabetes management. Where do they come from and do they work? Here's my disclosure slide. So the Rank Nutrition Lecture is named in honour of Harry Keane and I'm sure he needs little introduction to many of you. Harry was widely regarded as a pioneer of diabetes, not only for his groundbreaking research, but also for the fact that clinical management was dear to his heart and he retained his clinical practice throughout his career. Harry believed that diabetes education was fundamental to the successful management of diabetes. And of course, included in that was dietary advice and support. I was lucky enough to have contact with Harry during the 1990s when, with Ruri Holman, we organised and co-chaired an annual symposium for diabetes specialist dietitians at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And I think Harry was unusual in that, for a physician, he had great knowledge of diabetes interventions for people with diabetes, and he was unafraid to give people dietary advice and support in his clinical practice. So, in honour of his memory, I'm delighted to be delivering the Rank Nutrition Lecture this year. So, I've divided my talk into various sections. First of all, looking where the nutritional guidelines come from, and secondly, do they work? So, starting with a bit of background. And I think it's really important to state up front that dietary advice for people with diabetes is rooted in personal philosophy, belief and experience. And this isn't just the philosophy, belief and experience of people with diabetes. It's also true of health professionals. Everybody eats food and it seems to me everybody has very strong opinions about food. And often people's experience and beliefs are translated in a way that isn't necessarily evidence-based. And that's partly because historically dietary advice was delivered in a very prescriptive fashion with the health professional seen as the expert and the person with diabetes a passive recipient. And it was also according to current beliefs and current practice. And it's really only in the past 30 or 40 years that evidence-based nutritional guidelines have been developed and applied. And I'd just like to explore this a bit further by looking at the evolution of dietary advice. So in the pre-insulin era, of course, starvation diets were the norm. But with the discovery of insulin, carbohydrate came to the fore. And the initial diets were carbohydrate restriction diets, for example, the Lawrence Lyme diet, where people usually started off on about 100 grams of carbohydrate a day and may increase it to 150. 
Then there was a big argument in the 1930s about free diets versus carbohydrate restriction. And I think it's fair to say carbohydrate restriction won the day. And over the next decades, we used a form of carbohydrate prescription. And in the UK, this was translated as the exchange system, where one exchange was equivalent to 10 grams of carbohydrate. And people with diabetes were given so many exchanges at each meal. Then, of course, focus moved to macrovascular disease prevention, and we moved on to so-called healthy eating with low-fat diets, high-fiber diets, and low GI diets. And this was really exemplified in the Eat Well Guide, which is commonly used to advise people about healthy eating. And where are we today? Well, we now stress individualized advice. So for those with type 1 diabetes, it's carbohydrate counting and insulin adjustment. And for those with type 2, uh, weight loss for the 90% living with overweight or obesity and leading to a chance of remission. So the focus has changed from carbohydrate restriction to a more liberal, individualized approach. But the reason I'm showing this slide is because we're often accused of changing our advice about the information we offer to people with diabetes. And I think that's true. But it's really important to remember that that's because nutrition is a very young science. The first vitamin was discovered less than 100 years ago. And as information and research has evolved, so have changes in dietary advice to match the evidence that we now know. So let's look at the aims of nutritional guidelines, and they're really no different from the aims of medical management of diabetes. So supporting people in achieving and maintaining optimal glycemic control, optimal body weight, and of course, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. But most importantly, trying to maintain enjoyment of food and quality of life. People don't eat food because they happen to be diagnosed with diabetes. They eat food because they enjoy it and because of cultural norms. And that has to be addressed when we're looking at nutritional guidelines. So let's look now at the evidence base, and I want to spend a bit more time on this. So I've just put up a hierarchy pyramid to show evidence for clinical studies. And you'll see at the bottom, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have experts or contensus opinion or usual clinical practice. And this did guide dietary guidelines up until 30 or 40 years ago. And then at the top, of course, we have meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, and this is considered the highest quality evidence. So randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, or meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials are often considered highest quality evidence. And we also have cohort studies or epidemiology. I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on. We also have genetic consortia and Mendelian randomization studies, um, and these provide information about genetic influences on food choice and also nutritional biomarkers for disease. So there are a variety of high quality evidence now available to help us formulate nutritional guidelines. So what are the sources of evidence for current nutritional guidelines? Well, randomized control trials are widely considered the gold standard. And most diabetes dietary recommendations are largely based on RCT data or from meta-analyses of RCTs. But of course, randomized control trials do have both advantages and limitations for establishing cause and effect for lifetime exposure. And I'd just like to list the advantages. So what randomized control trials can do, which no other study can, is to determine causation between a specific nutrient, food, or dietary pattern and a clinical outcome. They're important because they minimize or eliminate confounding, and that's a major challenge in most observational studies, and they can establish efficacy and safety. However, there are limitations for randomized controlled trials in terms of dietary survey work. So firstly, specificity. So really, RCTs are suited to the evaluation of a single specific intervention, which is, of course, why they're widely used for pharmaceutical studies. And it's important to remember that the differences between intervention and comparator groups must be biologically meaningful. And in a lot of dietary studies, 
we can show statistically significant differences in, for example, body weight or haemoglobin A1c, but these are not necessarily clinically significant. There's also time scale. The duration of intervention often needs to be several years, and there's generalisation, translating the results from RTTs to general populations, and that can be challenging. So let's look at these individually, and let's start with specificity. And what I'm going to do is use examples from, from my research to show what I mean. So in terms of specificity, I'm going to talk about the DIAMOND trial, which was a small feasibility study run by the Nuffield Department of Primary Care at Oxford University under Paul Aveyard and Susan Jebb. And I'd just like to pay tribute to Elizabeth Morris, who was the GP who ran the study. So the aim of this study, it was a small feasibility study, and we were trying, based in primary care, trying to assess the effect of a food-based, low-energy, low-carbohydrate diet for diabetes remission. And uh, this study, as I say, was feasibility, so a small short-term study, including 33 people with type 2 diabetes, and you can see that their baseline characteristics are fairly typical of those with type 2 diabetes. We excluded those treated by insulin because of the risk of hypoglycemia and those treated by SGLT2 inhibitors because of the risk of euglycemic DKA. And the subjects were randomised to the intervention group or usual clinical care and then followed up for 12 weeks. So the intervention was eight weeks of a food-based diet which provided 800 to 1,000 calories a day over 60 grams of protein and less than 100 grams of carbohydrate per day. An important part of the intervention was a behavioural programme, which included a variety of strategies, including goal setting, action planning, self-monitoring, managing triggers and problem solving. And the comparative group received best practice care by guidelines, and they were also given Diabetes UK type 2 diabetes leaflets. So what were the results? Well, as I say, it was a feasibility study and what it showed was that 100% attempted the dietary intervention, there was 100% fidelity to the delivery of the intervention and no dropouts with 100% attending the final follow-up session. We also had secondary outcomes of biomedical data and we showed that weight reduced by 7.5 kilos more in the intervention group and haemoglobin A1c reduced significantly in the intervention group versus no change in the control group. So we showed that this study was successful and it's now going on to a larger randomised control trial which is hoping to start later this year. But the question we're often asked here is which components were effective? Was it the low energy? Was it the low carbohydrate? Or was it the behavioural aspects? And of course, the answer is it was probably a combination of the three, but because each of these weren't tested individually, we cannot make that assumption. And that illustrates what I mean by the limitations of specificity in RCT, trying to base nutritional guidelines on a multi-component intervention can be very challenging. So moving on to time scale, we know in dietary surveys that the duration of intervention may need to be many years before we see any meaningful outcomes. And just an example of that is the ongoing controversy about the relationship between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular disease. We know that exposure of 20, 30, 40 or 50 years is needed to see any meaningful outcome. And of course, randomised controlled trials cannot be run for that period of time. There's also the fact that the intensity of intervention decreases over time. And again, I'd like to give you an example from my own research. So this was a small low carbohydrate study conducted with David Matthews Clinical Research Group in 2007. And the aims were to assess the impact of a ketogenic low carbohydrate diet on body weight in people with and without type 2 diabetes. Again, it was a small short-term study. We recruited 26 people and they were randomly allocated to either the low carbohydrate diet intervention or low fat healthy eating advice following Diabetes UK guidelines. And they were followed up for 12 weeks. 
And if we look at weight change, you can see at the end of three months, there was again about a 7.5 kilo difference in weight loss in the low carbohydrate intervention group. And this was statistically significant. This study ended at 12 weeks, but we did give the participants advice on maintaining their lifestyles in order to prevent further weight gain. And we then conducted post-study monitoring over a two-year period. And you can see what happened. So if we're talking about time scales for randomized controlled trials, if we reported this study at three months, six months or nine months, it would show that low carbohydrate diets were effective interventions for weight loss. But if this study was reported at 24 months, you'll see that difference has disappeared. And in fact, both groups have nearly returned to baseline. And that is an issue for randomized controlled trials. If we're going to say low carbohydrate diets are effective, I think we do need to have longer term data for a lot of dietary intervention trials before we can base nutritional guidelines on this information. Then there's generalization, of course. So we do know the majority of subjects who take part in randomized controlled trials are probably health aware and they have better outcomes than the general population. And this is shown in most weight loss studies where the control group do manage to lose weight, not often as much as the intervention group, but there do seem to be positive effects on all subjects taking part in randomized controlled trials. And that suggests that they're highly motivated. So can we translate the information from randomized controlled trials to the general population. And we also know if we use data from randomized controlled trials that people from different ethnic communities, women and the elderly are often underrepresented. So an alternative hierarchy for causality studies has been promoted and this is probably applicable to most dietary intervention studies. So you can see at the top of the pyramid, we still have randomized controlled trials, but then we have prospective cohort studies. And I'd like to talk a bit more about that because these are quite applicable to dietary surveys. So looking at prospective cohort studies, these are longitudinal studies that follow over time a group of cinema individuals who differ in certain factors, and again I've used the example of saturated fat intake, to determine how these factors affect certain outcomes, for example cardiovascular disease. And there are a number of these large-scale studies around the world, and examples include the Framingham Heart Study, the US Health Professionals and Nurse Studies, and the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer. And the evidence from prospective cohort studies, again, has both advantages and limitations. So in terms of advantages, prospective pr cohort studies include large numbers, so they can provide statistical power to adjust for covariates. They enable evaluation of specific nutrients, of foods and dietary patterns on disease risk. And by and large, in terms of evidence from dietary studies, they often report concordant findings with randomized controlled trials. But there are disadvantages. First of all, the major disadvantage is association that's reported in prospective cohort studies does not necessarily prove causality. And the nutritional assessment used from study to study are variable and they have variable validity. And there's also the fact that with longitudinal studies, diets may change over time. It's unlikely that people are eating the same food that they were eating 30 or 40 years ago. So that would need to be monitored in most prospective cohort studies. Another issue, and we're thinking about deriving nutritional guidelines from the available evidence, is do we, ter do we use foods or nutrients for the advice? And traditionally, nutrients was the approach because, as I've said, nutrition was a young science and it was initially rooted in deficiency diseases, for example, scurvy, beriberi and rickets. So the focus is very much on individual nutrients, in this case, vitamins. But with the current emphasis on non-communicable disease, including diabetes, this reductionist approach is not suitable. And as a result, the complex health effects and interactions of different foods and dietary patterns are now emphasised. And this is the approach that's most frequently used. 
And we do know that specific foods and dietary patterns rather than individual nutrients are associated with a reduced risk of disease and improved health. So using saturated fat again as the example. Although this is controversial, there appears to be no reported association between saturated fatty acid intake and coronary heart disease. But we do know that the saturated fats found in yoghurt, cheese and fish seem to be associated with reduced risk and the saturated fats found in butter and red meat with increased risk. So although the nutrient shows no association, specific foods do seem to. And of course we have the ongoing battle between carbohydrate and fat for weight loss in people with type 2 diabetes. Does low carb work? Does low fat work? And in fact, overall, it's energy restriction rather than macronutrients for weight loss in people with type 2 diabetes. So I'd just briefly like to go through the main Diabetes UK nutritional guidelines now and just talk a bit about how they were derived. So again, I'd like to pay tribute to Douglas Twenifor, who's the Deputy Head of Care at Diabetes UK. He and I co-chaired uh, the subcommittee for Diabetes UK. And the committee was convened in about 2015, um, and we invited diabetes specialist dietitians with relevant expertise in different areas to join the committee. We based the 2018 guidelines on the 2011 guidelines, but of course we expanded the literature search from January 2010 to July 2017. We include randomised controlled trials, intervention studies with the comparative group and also prospective cohort studies for the reasons I've just described. We found it impossible to undertake formal and meta-analyses as the studies were highly heterogeneous and had a high risk of bias. And we tried as far as possible to make recommendations in terms of foods, although it's impossible to avoid mentioning carbohydrate when you're discussing dietary interventions for people with diabetes. And we graded our recommendations using GRADE, where four is the highest quality evidence and one is the lowest. And I'd just like to run through the major recommendations now. So for type 1 diabetes and glycemic control, the recommendation now is adjusting insulin to carbohydrate intake. And this is usually um, delivered through structured education and is high-grade evidence. And this is the approach that is recommended to most people with type 1 diabetes. And it's applicable to those using multiple daily injections or insulin pumps. Uh, but for those who are on fixed insulin regimens, there's lower grade evidence that consistent quantities of carbohydrates should be recommended. But the overall recommendation for type 1 diabetes is carbohydrate counting and insulin adjustment. So for type 2 diabetes in terms of glycemic control, for the 90% of those with type 2 diabetes also living with overweight and obesity, weight loss of at least 50% is prioritised. There's also high-grade evidence that Mediterranean-style diets improve glycemic control and slightly weaker evidence for individualised education for carbohydrate management, low GI diets and reducing the total amount of carbohydrate. There's also a physical activity recommendation which is high-grade evidence which I've put in here uh, but as I'm talking about nutritional guidelines I'll say no more about that now. Then, of course, cardiovascular disease risk reduction is an important component of dietary recommendations. And what the evidence tells us is that Mediterranean and DASH-style diets will reduce cardiovascular risk factors in people with diabetes. And much of this data is based on prospective cohort studies. And you can see the key features listed here. And as far as possible, attempts were made to make these recommendations in terms of foods and dietary patterns rather than nutrients. Then my particular area of interest, type 2 diabetes and weight management. So for those living with overweight or obesity, for type 2 remission, aim for a weight loss of at least 15 kilos as soon as possible after diagnosis. And this of course is based on the results of the direct study. 
For those not aiming for remission, to improve glycemic control and reduce cardiovascular risk, aim for at least a 5% weight loss. And of course, there's greater benefits for greater weight loss. And then at the bottom, recommendations to adopt an individualized approach, including dietary, physical activity, surgical and medical strategies that are recommended for people without diabetes. And of course, it was impossible to grade this recommendation, so it doesn't have a grade. But I would like to talk a lot more about this individualised approach because it is key to weight management in type 2 diabetes. And a question I'm often asked, of course, is what's the best diet for weight loss? And I'm just going to talk a bit more about that now. So if we look at dietary strategies for weight loss, I've just listed some commonly used strategies here. This is not an exhaustive list, just a few that are commonly met in clinical practice. And these in the green box at the top show evidence of efficacy. That is, we have randomised controlled trials that show that these diets are effective for improving glycemic control and for weight loss in people with type 2 diabetes. For some, there are a lot of studies and strong evidence, for example, low carbohydrate diets, and for some such as intermittent fasting, there are just two or three randomised controlled trials. Then we have low GI diets, and there's no evidence of efficacy for weight loss, although studies have been done. And here we do have evidence that low GI diets are effective for improving glycemic control, but most studies don't report a positive effect on weight. Then at the bottom we've got all other diets, and there's no evidence for these simply because the studies haven't been done, and I think these would not generally be recommended in practice. There is a glaring omission here, and that's a commercial groups such as Weight Watchers and Slimming World. And the reason I haven't included these is that although there's evidence of efficacy in general populations, we don't have specific studies in people with type 2 diabetes. If we extrapolate from general populations, we can assume that they are effective, and in fact, they're often prescribed in various areas of the country. But for people with type 2 diabetes, we don't have specific studies investigating their effect. And Mike Lean's group in Glasgow recently published a forest plot of different weight managed strategies for type 2 diabetes. And you can see it's difficult to say that any particular strategy is any better than any other strategy. The only exception, of course, is very low energy diets, which you can see at the top, which seem to induce greater weight loss than all the other strategies. But I think what's really remarkable about this plot is the amount of studies and meta-analyses that have taken place looking at the role of low carbohydrate diets. And again, this is a particular interest of mine, and I'd like to talk a bit more about that now. So Diabetes UK says that for weight management, low carbohydrate diets are safe and effective over the short term, although it's important to remember that there are none significant differences between low carbohydrate diets and other dietary strategies for weight loss. And I was lucky enough to be included on the subcommittee for the Scientific Advisory Committees on Nutrition report, looking at lower carbohydrate diets for adults with type 2 diabetes and this was published in May 2021. It's probably the most comprehensive analysis to date. It comprises high quality evidence from systematic reviews and meta-analysis of randomised controlled trials and includes 43 primary RCTs with just under 4,500 participants. And I'd just like to summarise the conclusions here. So low carbohydrate diets are effective for people with type 2 diabetes. They reduce haemoglobin A1c by about 6 millimoles per mole and weight by about 5 kilos. If we look at glycemic control over the short term, and that studies lasting up to 6 months, they do show a significantly greater reduction in haemoglobin A1c, fasting glucose and also triglycerides compared to other dietary strategies. But for studies lasting longer than 6 months, this benefit is not maintained. And in terms of weight loss, there seems to be no evidence of greater weight loss at any time point. So although low carbohydrate diets are effective, they do not appear to demonstrate superiority over other strategies for weight loss in people with type 2 diabetes.
It's important to remember too that low carbohydrate diets may lead to hyperglycemia and medication adjustment is advised. And of course, that is a plus for a lot of people because they can reduce diabetes medication if they adopt a low carbohydrate diet. So now on to the thorny problem of do nutritional guidelines work? So I really want to look at the translation to practice. So the first thing to say about the Diabetes UK guidelines is that they are evidence-based and because they're based on randomised controlled trials, they've been shown to be safe and effective. But it's also important to remember that the majority of dietary intervention studies, whatever the intervention, show some evidence of efficacy. And there is limited evidence for one particular strategy. And this is quite challenging for a lot of people health professionals especially working in diabetes care because all they want to know is what to say to people with diabetes and if we don't have strong evidence for one particular strategy it can be quite challenging. So let's look at barriers for translation to practice. So what we're promoting now of course is individualised person-centred evidence-based dietary guidelines but there are barriers in the way of this. And I think it's fair to say that there are knowledge and experience of health professionals, for example, dietitians and primary care health professionals. And that's often because behavioural components are a fundamental part of delivering behaviour change advice. And this is something that's often quite challenging for people who are not used to working in this way. So if we look at dietitians to start with, and I have heard criticism that dietitians only give people healthy eating advice, they hand out the Eat Well Guide and that's it. My experience is not that at all. Most diabetes specialist dietitians do not practice in this way. But it can be challenging for the non-specialist who is not necessarily up to date. And of course very little training is offered. And I hope to remedy that in Oxford on a project I work with, with the chief clinical dietitian, Angela Hargreave. So we designed a training programme for dietitians. This is all dietitians, not just diabetes specialist dietitians. And it was matched to publish diabetes competencies. It was delivered to 47 di dietitians in Oxfordshire. And when we evaluated that work, we showed that there was a significant increase in both knowledge and confidence for dietitians when they were giving advice to people with diabetes and in fact this project won an award at the Quality and Care Award Ceremony in 2017 and the Diabetes Specialist Group of the British Dietetic Association published new competencies last year and Andrew and I are now working on a new training programme matched to those competencies. So let's look at primary care health professionals who deal with the majority of people with type 2 diabetes. And quite often they have little or no training in dietary advice. And I don't think you need me to tell you about the issues with resources and time in primary care. So we were trying to upskill primary care health professionals specifically to give dietary advice to people with type 2 diabetes. And this is an initiative from the Thames Valley Dietitian Forum. So it was supported by the Thames Valley Diabetes Strategic Clinical Network, which is part of NHS England. And the aim was to support delivery of consistent evidence-based dietary advice to people with type 2 diabetes, given by health professionals working in primary care. So this resource is a support for health professionals and not necessarily for people with type 2 diabetes. So the first thing we devised was a simple treatment algorithm. So once people were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, regardless of their BMI, they were referred to local structured education. So this was step one. If they were able to attend that education, they would hopefully get the support and the advice that they needed then. If they were unable to, and their BMI was below 25, they were given access to Diabetes UK booklets and also links to resources that they could use. If they were able to attend structured education and they had a BMI over 25 kilograms per meter squared, they were then referred to local weight management programs as part of that local structured education. 
but if they didn't go to structured education, uh, we gave health professionals advice on signposting local weight management groups. If they were able to attend that, then they were referred, and if not, then they were offered individual weight loss by advice uh, in primary care. And quite often, the last step here for those requiring weight management is, is often the first step in primary care. So we tried to turn this on its head. And we provided resources to the local, to all primary care health professionals. So they had refer, referral criteria for each of the groups. They had contact information for each of the groups. So they were able to refer directly in clinic at the time that the patient was, the person with diabetes was there. So it was a four-step progress. Step one, as I say, refer to local structured education. So everybody with diabetes would be referred to local structured education. If they chose not to go, those with a BMI less than 25 kilograms per meter squared were provided dietary advice. For those with a BMI over 25, they were given advice for and referred to local weight and management, weight management groups. And the final step, which, as I said, is often the first step in primary care these days, was to then offer individualised weight management advice and support. And to do this, we gave professionals training in behavioural aspects and also access to resources they could use, for example, low-carbohydrate diets and Mediterranean diets that they could then give to the people they saw in clinic. So I want to talk a bit more about the environmental in impacts of trying to implement nutritional guidelines. And it's enormously challenging for people to make individual dietary change against a background of society where high energy, high fat, high sugar foods are widely available. And we know that the prevalence of obesity and diabetes continues to rise. And it is highly unlikely that dispensing dietary advice on an individual basis will be effective. Policy changes at the population level are more likely to affect change. And we've seen that recently in the UK with, for example, the sugar tax. So we need multi-stakeholder initiatives at the community level in order to affect change so people find nutritional guidelines easier to adopt. And in order to do this, I worked on a programme called Community Interventions for Health. And this was supported by the Oxford Health Alliance, which was a charity set up by David Matthews in 2003. And our aim was to evaluate these community-based strategies to improve the risk factors for non-communicable disease. And it was a controlled experimental community-based studies in three low and middle income countries. So our centres were Hangzhou City in China, Kerala State in India and Mexico City. Each of the sites selected two similar communities to act as intervention and control sites. So there were hundreds of thousands of people taking part in this study, but of course we couldn't evaluate them all. So 36,000 individuals were selected by random sampling for evaluation. We evaluated at baseline and then at 24 months after the introduction of our interventions, and we used validated questionnaires and some biometric data. And the dietary interventions were health education, but also structural change. So we used posters, point of decision prompts, healthy cooking demonstrations and community based nutrition classes. But of course, knowledge doesn't lead to behaviour change. And what we wanted to do was create an environment where the healthy choice was the easy choice. So in terms of dietary interventions, we also included structural change. So we introduced subsidised healthy options in school and workplace canteens. And in India, we distributed vegetable seeds and fertiliser so people could grow their own. And here's an example of some of the dietary interventions that we used in CIH. And you can see that we worked in Mexico with the school meal service. We changed the menus in workplace canteens in India. There's some examples of the health education we used, and there's a cooking class going on in the bottom left in India. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we look at the results, first of all, we measured body mass index and fruit and vegetable intake a day, and this was from questionnaire data. And if you look at 
the graph on the left, you'll see that although BMI increased in both the control and the intervention groups, the rate of increase in the intervention group was ameliorated. And if we look at fruit and vegetable intake, you can see that it decreased in the control group and increased in the intervention group. So it seems as if community interventions, health education and structural change can have a positive effect on diet. So our conclusions were that our community-based interventions were effective for promoting healthy diets and so making it easier for people to stick to nutritional guidelines by significantly reducing the rate of increase of BMI, significantly increasing fruit and vegetable intake and some data I didn't show about salt, added salt at the table was also reduced in the intervention group. So if I can summarise what I've been talking about in terms of nutritional guidelines, our current nutritional guidelines are evidence-based and they demonstrate safety and efficacy. But it's really important to remember there's no one-size-fits-all and individualised and person-first strategies are recommended. I firmly believe that environmental change is necessary to support implementation of guidelines it's no good pointing the finger at the individual and telling them they have to change their diet while the rest of society is supporting unhealthy eating practices. And please remember, nutrition is a relatively young science and so the recommendations will probably change in the future as more research is done and more evidence published. And there are some inconsistencies, of course, about the advice we give people with diabetes and try and reduce this. The American Diabetes Association and Diabetes UK plan to reduce joint guidelines in the future and I think Dougie Twenifor is meeting uh, at the ADA sessions this summer in order to promote this plan. So I'd just like to finish with my acknowledgement slides and I've worked with a number of groups in the past 30 years in Oxford. My first job in Oxford was given to me by the late Robert Turner and Rory Holman I would like to acknowledge the OCDEM clinical team, the OCDEM diabetes dietitians, and in particular Angela Hargreaves, who I'm pleased to call both a friend and a colleague, uh, the members of the SACAN subcommittee, the Diabetes UK Nutrition subcommittee, and in particular Douglas Twenifor, the Nuffield Department of Primary Care Health Service, run by Susan Jeb and Paul Aviard, the OCDEM clinical research group run by David Matthews, the OCDEM Metabolic Research Group run by Frederick Karp and um, the members of the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre who I've worked closely with over the past two or three years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pam. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Leanne. Yeah. Always informative. I always learn something off your lectures, <laughs> no matter how many times I've heard you speak. Um, <laughs> So there are a couple of things I noticed. You kept on saying about these challenges, and I guess one of them is nutritional guidelines. What is going to be our biggest challenge going forward? Uh, I still think, well, I think we really have pretty robust evidence now for most of the nutritional guidelines that, that we produce. So I think as more research comes along, we probably need to refine what we say. But I don't think that's a huge challenge anymore. I think really it's about the fact that we haven't got a specific uh, strategy that we can recommend. People feel safer if they know what they have to say and they know what they have to do. Um, so I think it's quite challenging for people to try and uh, bring some flexibility when they're applying nutritional guidelines. Uh, the second challenge I think really is about uh, dissemination and translation to practice. So we might have wonderful guidelines but unless they're actually used in practice, they're little or no use. And I think we need to invest a bit more in training and supporting those health professionals who are giving dietary advice to people with diabetes. But I have to say, the greatest challenge of all really is this implementation. We live in this so-called um, obesogenic society and expecting people to manage their weight and make healthy change is really, really challenging. So I think what we need here is a kind of multi-stakeholder approach. The individual, of course, has to take responsibility, but so do food industries, so do town planners to make walking and 
easier in towns. I mean, we need to go across the board here. Education services, of course, the health services, but also the government. I think they need to step up and take some responsibility for changing our society so we can make healthy choices much easier for people both with and without diabetes. Yeah, I would agree. I completely agree. So I've also got, um, I know you talk about low carbohydrate diets and it's something, as you know, I'm interested in, in researching probably the higher fat end for different reasons. But if someone does go on a, a lower carbohydrate diet, do you think the quality of fat they go to, is it just high fat that's important that helps them lose the weight or is there something in the quality of fat that they need to consider that they're consuming? Because as you said, it takes a long time to see yeah. outcomes. <laughs> That's a great question. Of course, no low carb diet study has gone beyond two or three years at the moment. So we can't answer that question. But if you're going to ask me to speculate, I'm happy to do that. Speculate. First to <laughs> the first thing to remember is most people who go on a low carbohydrate diet often choose that because they wish to lose weight. So they're reducing their energy intake. So actually, they don't necessarily switch to a high fat diet. So because they're reducing their energy intake, quite often their fat intake doesn't change. So the quantity of fat often doesn't change. They don't necessarily adopt a high fat diet. For example, people don't sit down with a plate and eat a block of butter or consume pounds of cheese. Fat's usually eaten in association with carbohydrate. So there's often we often see little or no change in total fat intake in people who've reduced their energy intake, but the type of fat well, I'd like to hand over to you, Leanne, because this is your area of expertise. And I actually believe the type of fat is fundamental. And that's something we know almost nothing about. So I think some research in that area would be really productive. And I guess in that, in the fat quality, if we are dealing with people who maybe have more metabolic complications or at risk of metabolic complications, it becomes more important to look at these longer term studies and understand how it impacts. Yeah, yeah I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, and I guess you said that um, giving advice, particularly to people with diabetes, can be challenging and maybe slightly scared, daunting for some people. But it should it only be dietitians that give this advice to di dietary advice to people with diabetes? I'm a dietitian, so I'm going to say, of course, everybody with diabetes should see a dietitian. But I'm also a pragmatist, and the bottom line is, we now have about four million people with diabetes in the UK. There just aren't enough dietitians to go around. Yeah. So I think really a role for the specialist dietitian is to start uh, taking responsibility for training and upskilling people, for example, in primary health care who, who are going to be largely responsible for people with type 2 diabetes. So I think it should be a dietitian, but of course, I think we all know that's never going to happen. So what we need to do is think about working in a smarter way so we can support more people with diabetes. And I guess it's also informing people that we want to talk, help these people is with, I guess, social, I, I call it pop science, as you know, what comes out of the media. There's always the, the thing that's coming next that may be the next, I guess, quick fix. And it's understanding where they fit long term or how they're achievable long term. Absolutely right. And I think that's one of the issues with that we have with a lot of our dietary interventions is they do tend to be short term. Um, and so we don't have any longer term data. Great. So again, Pam, I'd like to say many congratulations. Very well deserved awardee. Um, thank I'm you. I'm miss working with you. Me <laughs> I too. Would like to you. I would like to thank you for all the contribution you have done in DUK nutritional guidelines with patients. And say so have a nice day and good luck. <laughs> thank you, Leanne.